Okay, yesterday we saw with slope fields that we can actually look at a graph of a relation without knowing the relation. If we just know it's derivative, then we can graph slope fields. We get a general idea of what it looks like. But while that's useful for you in a general idea, maybe for making some guesses as to what a particular value might be, it's not all that useful for being really precise. In other words, we don't get like an equation that we can plug in. Um, so that's what we're going to be doing today. We're actually going to be we're going to have a differential equation. And we're going to solve that differential equation, which will give us a function. Um, now, all three of these are, are examples of differential equations. Um, the first one is called a second order differential equation because it's the second derivative. Okay. Uh, the next one is also a second order differential equation, but most at y double prime. And this is called a first order differential equation because we have just the first derivative. We are only going to be concerning ourselves with this one right here. Okay. Um, uh, with this type of, I guess, not this one, this type. Uh, so the solution to a differential equation is a function. Okay, think about if you, if you uh, are trying to, it's, it's weird, but if you're solving a differential equation, you actually get an equation as an answer. Okay, it's, it's a, but it's a function, and we're going to solve it for y. So it's only going to be in terms of x. Okay. Um, now, differential equations, you can. Some of them are really easy to solve. And some of them are actually not even possible to solve. Okay. Um, so we kind of run this whole gamut. In this class, we're only going to work with solvable ones. And they're going to be, on the level of complexity, be fairly simple to solve. Now, that doesn't mean they're simple. It means compared to other options, they are simple. So this is going to be very algebra intensive. Um, it kind of dawned on me earlier why we stay. I was thinking, why don't we do this when we do implicit differentiation? Because it's so similar. There's so much algebra involved with solving a differential equation that it's good to have all this practice under your belt doing other things and then kind of saving this for last. Um, also, this we're going to be applying integrals a lot. So we really need that practice with integrals. So anytime you're stumbling with this, it's because you're, you need practice integrating functions and indefinite integrals. Okay? The general idea here is going to be um, we can solve a differential equation if we can separate the y's from the x's. If we can separate all the x's and y's on separate sides of the equation, then we can solve that differential equation in general. Okay? So look at this first example. So solve dy dx equals xy. Now, first off, how many x's does this equation have? Two. One? You said two first. Why did you say two? Okay, so there are two x's. There's a dx and there's an x. How many y's does it have? Two, there's a dy and a y. We need to get all of the x terms on one side, all of the y terms on the other side. Okay? So on this problem, well, how would we do that? How would we separate the x's and y's? And this is this is gonna be a little bit different because up until now, dy dx, I told you it's a variable. Just treat it like it's one variable, you can't separate it, it's dy dx. I lied to you. Okay? It's absolutely two variables and we can absolutely separate. In fact, we've been doing that the whole time. If you think about it, anytime we wrote the integral of you know, f of x, what did I put after f of x? I put dx. And that was because if I started off with dy dx and I multiply by dx, I get dy equals, right? And so if I integrate dy, what do I get if I integrate dy? Think about it. Integrate 1 dy, well, we just, not derivative, integrate. Like what's, I mean, think about it. What's the integral of dx? Okay, so what's the integral of dy? Y. So y would be the integral of f of x dx. So really this whole time that we've been integrating, indefinite integrals in particular, where we said, really what we were saying was dy dx is equal to f prime of x, which that's true. That's really what we're doing. And then we were separating the variables. We're multiplying by d, dx. We get dy equals f prime of x dx. How do I solve for y? I integrate. The integral of dy is y. The integral of f prime of x dx is f of x. Okay. Which y equals f of x is usually how you started out in algebra one, learning function notation. They said, guys, y equals f of x. It's the exact same thing. Okay. So. We have been doing this the entire time without saying it. Okay. Now, though, the difference is we have a y on this side. It's not just a function in terms of x. So the derivative 
depends on x and y. So let's start solving this by rewriting the problem. So dy dx equals xy. Now, if I want to separate these, how would I how would I get rid of the y on this side? What would we need to do? Divide by y. How would I get rid of dx over here? Okay, so we get <coughs> dy over y equals x dx. Okay. Well, now we integrate. Once we get everything, once we get the variable separated, we integrate both sides. The integral of dy over y. Well, what's that going to get us? That's, that's one of our trig or not a trig rules. That's one of our rules. D u over u, what was it? So it's a natural log of absolute value of y. I'm just going to write that natural log of y. Um, yeah. Equals. And what's the integral of x? So we get x squared over 2 plus c. Remember, this is an indefinite number. So how would we solve this for y? Because remember, our solution is a function in terms of x, which means we need to solve for y. And so how do we get rid of, what's the inverse operation of lin? E. So we raise e to the power of both sides. And so coming up here, we get y equals e to the power of x squared over 2 plus c, all in the x one. Okay, now that, that does make a difference. And we could be done on some problems right here. But for other problems, it's handy to rewrite this in another, a slightly different way. So we can write this also, if I start rewriting it, y equals e to the x squared over 2 plus c. And then, oops, plus c is an exponent. Make sure it's smaller. And then I remember, well, let me just write it and see if you guys can remember. We get y equals e to the x squared over 2 times e to the c. How's that come about? Okay. Since we're adding in the exponents to the same as multiplying with the same base. Now e to the c is just a constant. Right? So we can replace e to the c and we can't we can and we will with just another c. So y is equal to a big C times e to the x squared over two. So these are actually perfectly one hundred percent equivalent to each other. You just need to be able to recognize that they're the same. Now this is actually called a general solution in the sense that C could be a lot of different numbers depending on which X and Y values we want our function to take on at some point. Okay, so the general solution, this is kind of like the slope field where the slope field shows all these possibilities, nothing in particular. And then you get a particular solution, we picked a point and then we drew, it kind of drew itself out on the calculator or by hand we would follow a similar process. So we can do something similar here. We can find a particular solution. Okay? And so that's what this says up here. And the particular solution depends on the initial condition, or what we also call it, initial condition or a boundary condition. It's synonymous. They mean the same thing. And so in this case, it says find a particular solution to this differential equation, dy dx equals 3x over negative y, when y equals 5 equals f of negative 4. Now this is kind of a cryptic way of giving us definitely a y value, but right here, we also have an x value. It's kind of a unique way of writing it, but you see weird things like that sometimes. So you just need to be able to kind of roll with the punches. Okay. So we want to find this the particular solution. So the first thing we do when we're asked to solve a differential equation is separate the variables. Always. Okay, so I'm going to rewrite the problem. dy dx equals 3x over negative 1. And separating variables will usually involve, let me rephrase no, usually. Well, usually involve multiplication or division of some form on both sides. So in this case, since negative y is in the denominator, well, to get rid of negative y here, I'd multiply by negative y on both sides. And then multiply by dx on both sides. And so we have negative y dy equals 3x dx. Once we've separated the variables, made them on separate sides of the equation, then we integrate both sides. Now, sometimes the integral is straightforward, like here. Other times you get a rule like dy over y, where you have to recognize that's a natural log. Other times you may get like y squared, which means you'd use a power rule, right? Sometimes you may get 1 over y squared, so you'd write it a negative exponent and then use a power rule. So you're going back to, all we're doing here is we're integrating these separately as if it didn't matter this was a y, because it really doesn't. We're going to integrate this, this expression 
and then we integrate this expression completely separately. So it's not anything different from what you've done with indefinite integrals in the past. Okay? So if we integrate negative y dy, what do we get? Power rule? All right, negative y squared over 2? Plus c, but we're not going to write the plus c here. We just put 1 plus c at the end. Okay? So that's just kind of a standard thing. We could, but then we'd have a c and another c, and they don't subtract out because they're different, potentially. And so then we'd have a c1 minus c2, which is just another constant. So we just call it a c in general. Okay? Uh, 3x dx, so if we integrate that, we get 3x squared over 2. Now we put our plus C. Okay. Now at this point, this is the ideal point to do this. You don't have to do it right here, but it's usually easiest at this point. We can go ahead and substitute in our Y value and our X value and solve for C. Okay. And it's easiest to do it now. Sometimes other, I mean, you don't have to do it right now, but usually easiest. So we plug in 5 for Y and negative 4 for X. So we have negative 5 squared over 2 equals 3 times uh, negative 4 squared over 2 plus c. So we have negative 25 over 2 equals, well, negative 4 squared is 16. Divided by 2 is 8. So 3 times 8 gives us 24 plus c. All right, so c, well, negative 25 over 2 is like negative 12.5. Subtract 24, so we get negative 36.5. We take this C value that we got and we plug it right back in up here at the place we were right before we plugged in. Right? And so that becomes our new equation. Negative Y squared over 2 equals 3X squared over 2 minus 36.5. Now we're solving for Y, and this is where I say there's a lot of algebra today. Is this, this part's all calculus, and it's not, it's very rarely super complicated. What gets complicated is when you have to solve for the y part. That's uh, more complicated. So think algebraically, we want to solve for y. So we have a denominator of 2, and we have a negative. So we can go ahead and multiply both sides by negative 2, kind of kill two birds with one stone. Get rid of the denominator and the negative in one step. And so we have y squared equals, multiplying by negative 2, well, the 2s here are going to divide out, but the negative won't. So I have negative 3x squared. And then negative 2 times uh, negative 36.5 gives me positive 73. And we want to solve for y. So how do we solve for y? Square root both sides. And so y is equal to plus or minus the square root of negative 3x squared plus 73. Now remember, our solution to a differential equation is a function. Is this a function? If, I'm this is not a function. What makes it not a function? No. No. How do you believe it's not one to one? Okay, plus or minus. Okay. Now it doesn't have to be one to one to be a function. Right? It has to be one to one to have an inverse. But that's okay. But I know what you mean, but, okay, so plus or minus, that means it doesn't pass the vertical line test. That means that there's not one x for every, one y for every x. There's two y's for this x, so it has a vertical line test. One to one means one x for every y and one y for every x. So that means it has an inverse. Yep. Good, though. Very good use of vocabulary. I, honestly, my sophomore in college, I was like, I don't know what one to one means. And, uh, I, yeah, so that's good. Okay, so how do we make it one to one? How do, we, <laughs> how do we make it a function? Well, we get rid of the plus or minus, but which one? So the, the, the key here is we have an initial condition. We know y has to be positive 5. Is it possible to get a negative out of a square root by itself? Like if I take the square root of any number, will I ever get just a negative? No. So the only way to make this positive is to have positive only. And so our function, our actual solution, is y equals the square root of negative 3x squared plus 73. Okay? Now I point this out because if your initial condition happened to be negative here, 
believe it or not, you'd get the same looking thing, and you'd have to realize that you need negative square root as your solution. Okay? And this is why, if you, if you remember yesterday when we were doing the particular solution on the graph, right? And you had the, the slope field, and it looked like it could be like this and like that. But when we actually picked a point that only drew one of them, it's because it's giving the solution, which is a function. It's going to pick either the positive or the negative, depending on your initial condition. All right. Um, Chris, would you read this last paragraph for us? Nice and loud, please. Earlier, it was mentioned that some differential equations are almost impossible to find. That is true of the general solution. However, particular solutions are often possible with numerical computer techniques. In fact, the desire to solve such equations is what inspired a physics professor. John D. Thomas, Thomas saw to invent the digital computer in the 1930s. Monty and Ecker were originally given credit for inventing the digital computer. However, it was actually Thomas saw. Look it up. Okay, so I looked it up because I was curious. And uh, there's John Thomasoff. He was a, um, at the time that this is talking about, he was a PhD student at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, married. Um, guy's PhD. Um, he was working on very complex differential equations. The calculators that were available then, which weren't anything like what you had not, were nothing like them. Um, couldn't do them. Just wasn't, either wasn't efficient enough, I'm not sure. Couldn't do them somehow. They would, they would take too long, and it would take so long that, you know, five lifetimes pass and finally it comes up with a solution, or it just couldn't do them. And so he started looking into basically writing, creating his own computer. Um, he actually went to University of Iowa. They paid him, they gave him a grant, I think it's like 700 bucks, which was a lot in the 30s, uh, to create a computer. He kept running into Roblox. He could, just couldn't, couldn't wrap his head around how to do it. And so one night he just went driving, middle of, got in the middle of Illinois, stopped at a bar, got a shot of bourbon. Suddenly everything just became clear to him. He got a, a napkin and wrote down the ideas that developed the very first digital computer, which is kind of cool. I mean, random story, but kind of cool. He just, happened upon the information. And then he actually w invented the, the first digital computer, meaning the computers you guys use now are all based on ideas that he had. In fact, what he used for memory on his little calculator is still used today in our RAM chips. The same concepts are still used. So anyway, um, and there's all kinds of stories like that where a, a philosopher or mathematician went out and had too much wine and came up with some wonderful idea. Descartes another example of that. So. Uh, if you ever, by the way, if you ever get a chance to take a history class on the history of mathematics or the history of science, I, I, you really should. I wish I, I wish I could have. All kinds of really cool stuff, stuff happen. Okay, so again, here's the key, guys. Tons of algebra today. Tons of algebra because you're solving for y. All right, the, the calculus part, not too much. Solving for y can be a, a lot. So you're gonna have to focus, focus in, practice that algebra. Um, keep in mind, y prime. What's that? dy dx. So if you see y prime, dy dx. Now before you start, I want to show you how to uh, do this on the calculator really quick. So we're going to go back to our first example, dy dx, get out your calculator. Now this is much like the graph yesterday. The CADs will do these, the regular inspires will not. So if you're calculator shopping and you're thinking, okay, I'm going to college, I need a calculator, and you have the choice between a CAS and a, just a standard non-CAS, CAS is computer algebra system. This is for any brand. It could be Casio or HP or TI. If you're planning on going science, go with CAS. That's my general response. By the same price. Okay. Um, but yeah, if you're, if you're buying a TI, uh, an Inspire CX CAS, which is the color one, um, they're 130, 140, something like that. That's possible. Well, on a test, but most in college, most most professors won't let you use a calculator on a test anymore. Homework is again, it, it's the same rule. For checking your answer, you can't beat it, right? And most they won't let you use it on a test anymore. So it's not it's a non-issue. Um, and then other a lot of like at UT in my physics class, I had a CAS calculator. No one ever said anything. I used it on every single test. They said bring a calculator. As long as you don't have to plug it in, you're fine. So and nowadays, I'd imagine as long as it's not wireless. Like you can't use your cell phone or whatever. Anyway, so using the calculator. So everybody turn the calculator. 
create a, you can do the document, or I believe you can do some scratch pad too. So we want a calculator page. Okay. Now, mo like most things we've done in this class, we go to menu, and we are in calculus. Now we have derivative, derivative point. Integral might be tempting, but we're not really integrating. We're, I mean, we are, but it's only part of it. And so if we go all the way here to the bottom and keep going, oops, not that one. Menu, calculus, I'm going to have to use my mouse. We're down to the bottom. Then you'll notice that we have a differential equation solver. And that's what we want to use. Differential equation, DE solver. Okay. Now the notation for this is very similar to whenever we did implicit differentiation, where we have to have an equation. Okay. Now, for example, one, it was dy dx equals xy. Right? How are we going to put dy dx in here? Well, this is where you need to remember that y prime is the exact same as dy dx. And the way you get to the prime button is if you press y and then your pi button, the apostrophe or whatever prime is in that menu. Okay? So y prime equals, it's an xy, we put comma, we put our independent variable, then our dependent variable. So x comma y. Enter. And you'll notice we don't get what we expected. We get xy times x plus uh, probably c1, um, which doesn't, that's not what we got. So notice it's saying xy times x. This thing's psi, the combination xy, is a variable by itself. Remember, this calculator, you can have variables that are names. I could call my variable Chris. No problem, we'll understand it. It won't be seen as c times h times r times s. I times i times k, it's probably your name. Times <laughs> Right? It won't see it that way. It sees it as a variable. So it, it doesn't do impl implied multiplication. We have to explicitly say we want to multiply. And so what we really wanted was y prime equals x times y. That's really what we wanted. And now if we press enter, you'll notice it says c2 e to the x squared over 2. We got e to the x squared over 2. And you may notice, well, it's C1, then C2. That's just your calculator is going to track different constants. It doesn't matter. 1, 2, doesn't matter. If you do this again, it'll get C3, then C4, then C5, until you create a new document. So it's just going to keep counting constant. It doesn't matter. So you just need to remember C2 is that constant. And that's what we got, C2 is the x squared over 2. Uh, the next example uh, was, we can check our answer on that as well. Uh, same idea, DE solve. Menu, calculus, and then I think the short one is D, which is convenient. Differential equation. Then we had y prime equals 3x divided by negative y. Okay? Comma x, comma y. Okay. And again, well, did it solve for y for us? Hmm? Not quite. What do we need to do to solve for y? Square. Square. Right. So square, square it. We need to square root it. So notice it couldn't solve for y. Why can't it solve for y, guys? Why can't it solve for y? Because square root is positive or negative. Positive or negative. It depends, right? It depends. So it just says, you know what? Y squared is this. you got to do the rest. But what if we want a particular solution? Well, the calculator is pretty smart. It'll do that for us too. I didn't show the period of this, so we wanted to watch this video. So go ahead and go up here and then go before this comma. We then type in and, the word and. And we need to type in our initial condition. Now, in this case, our initial condition was f of negative 4 equals 5. Well, the calculator doesn't know what f is, it knows what y is. So what we do is we type in y of negative 4, which is function notation with y, equals 5. And now, it gives us our, it does, it does solve for c this time. It still doesn't solve for y. I don't know why. But we get y. This would be easy to solve. Take the square root. Right? So the calculator will isolate the y, but I don't, I'm not confident that it will solve for y every single time. Okay. Now notice on the previous one, it didn't leave it as lin of y equals x squared over 2. So it does solve for y in some cases. Other cases it won't. So you kind of have to 
take whatever it gives you. If it's not y equals, you'd want to finish by solving for y. Okay? So you can, you can check your answers on the calculator. All right. So there are uh, nine problems, I'm pretty sure. And they are kind of long. So you might want to start now. Um, keep in mind, I'll give you a hint on number two. There's a rule for square roots. If we have the square root of A times B, we can write that as the square root of A times the square root of B. Similarly, if we have the square root of A, B, C, we can write that as the square root of A times the square root of B times the square root of C, and so on. Right? And so there's a hint for number two. 